you, Jens Peter. Um, thanks again for the invite and hello to everybody. Um, so as we said, uh, Thomas and I are uh, from Graz in Austria, or at least we work here, um, and we're part of the Open and Reproducible Research Group here, interested in the implementation um, of open science and its evaluation. Um, and what we'll present today are outcomes from a project which we've just completed. I was the, the uh, uh, principal investigator or project coordinator, and uh, Thomas was project manager called On Merit. Um, I will just very briefly go over the rationale for the project, but the main part of the presentation will be Thomas Lee, uh, presenting uh, what I think is great work that he's uh, led, um, which is about the stratification um, effects that we see that uh, can be attributed to the article processing charge model of open access publishing. So, um, <clears throat> when we talk about open science, we need to recognize that it's, it's not... Um, a distinct unity. Uh, it's an umbrella term for a bunch of different types of practices, uh, which broadly um, are about opening up scientific processes and products at all levels to everyone. But this uh, includes a lot of diverse things like making the, uh, the publications that our research appears in open, openly accessible, uh, so no paywalls. Um, it also means sharing uh, our data either in an open way or at least in a way that's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. It's about enabling open source software, infrastructure, tools uh, to carry out this science in a collaborative way, um, opening up um, our methods, protocols, materials. Um, some people consider that um, open science includes citizen science or, or kind of broader movements to um, increase participation be, uh, in research beyond the walls of uh, academia. Uh, and it's also about new ways of um, transparency um, and, and accountability in the evaluation of research, including the peer review process. So this is a lot of different types of practices, um, but underpinning those are a, a lot of different um, aims, a lot of values, uh, which we want to work towards. Um, uh, here, here's a slide from uh, a long time ago, uh, from 2015 now, where I just asked on Twitter um, what people thought the aims of open science were, um, and here we have uh, principles like transparency, accountability, inclusivity, responsibility, visibility, equality, um, and so on. All good stuff, um, obviously, but um, all very different things. And if you aim, for example, for um, the most uh, transparent science, um, uh, is this then, um, or, or uh, the most um, uh, visible science, uh, maybe, the policies that you would put in place to achieve that uh, might not be the policies that you would put in place for the most um, collaborative science, uh, let's say. And so one thing that I want to emphasize at the start is that equality, equity, inclusivity, democratization have always been key goals underpinning a lot of uh, the open science agenda. So if you look back to the uh, Budapest Open Access Initiative, kind of the foundational text of open access, let's say. You can see very utopian language about um, sharing language, learning between rich and poor and laying the foundation to uniting humanity in a common intellectual conversation and quest uh, for knowledge. In uh, Michael Nielsen's book, Reinvented Discovery, which uh, is uh, kind of a classic now, um, there's a whole chapter devoted to the democratization that can come through kind of networked science. Um, more recently, increased equity was listed as a key success factor in a stakeholder driven study. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, point made, inclusivity has always been kind of claimed as uh, one of the more central goals of open access by a lot of people. Um, but acknowledging that open science is a very diverse phenomenon um, with underpinned by a lot of different aims and principles, amongst which are, um, is equity, inclusivity. Um, we should ask uh, whose agenda um, is shaping the way that open science is implemented uh, um, as there's more and more reforms underway uh, to, to introduce open science led, um, uh, and, and but whose agenda is un underpinning the type of open science that we actually are seeing uh, implemented. And so then to say researchers, we're not a unity, 
Um, we all have very different disciplines, which come along with very different cultures and attitudes, different types of research, of course, and um, open science in um, a, a discipline like physics uh, probably differs greatly from open science in more humanities disciplines where they might, because of uh, this um, exclusion of uh, the English word science, uh, it, it doesn't kind of uh, cover the humanities usually, they might not feel that they're part of open science at all in the humanities. Um, and research funders, they have their own uh, agendas, of course, very often their research funding is linked uh, or, or is linked explicitly to uh, the agenda of growth and economic factors, research institutions um, very often are concerned primarily with the visibility and prestige of their um, institutions. And then of course, publishers who have um, a lot of uh, um, economic motives um, for engaging with open science in certain ways. And so we ask how, how do these different agendas shape the outcomes of open science, the types of open science that we see implemented? Uh, and then finally, uptake of open science isn't, um, it's not something that we can just do. Um, it depends on a lot of infrastructure being put in place. Um, and that in turn um, then depends on a lot of training, support, political will, and access to these resources is not distributed across academia. Um, to state the obvious, academia is unequal. There are structural inequalities across regions and uh, demographics. And um, the effects of cumulative advantage are, um, are well known in academia. So the concept of the Matthew effect, where the rich get richer. Um, if you're lucky and you win a prize early in your career, you're statistically more likely to win more prizes later than somebody who didn't, other, all other things being equal. And this effect has been seen at the level of journals, institutions, departments, countries, um, the level of individual attributes of researchers, including race and gender, and across a range of uh, scientific activities, including citations, peer review, public engagement, and funding acquisition. So this is all kind of the, the grist to the mill of, of, our, of uh, us being motivated within the On Merit project to ask this question, might open science, despite the fact that it wants to increase equity, actually be at risk in some cases of reinforcing existing privileges or maybe even creating new ones. The fact that open science is so uh, dependent upon resources that those resources um, are centralized in certain parts of the um, academic uh, landscape. And the fact that there are these effects of cumulative advantage which run rampant throughout kind of the prestige economy of academia. Um, could open science actually the way we implement it be at risk of negating its own aim of, of boosting equality. And this is where Thomas takes over and I stop sharing. Go Thomas. All right. Thank you, Tony. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yes, so this has been the, the focus of the Unmarried project where we really tried to examine these issues of equity in open science, um, including not just looking at, at um, science itself, but also the interface to industry and policy to ensure that we can have more equitable outcomes in this transition to, um, to open science. And the key uh, research output that we have in, in this regard was conducting a scoping review specifically on these dynamics of cumulative advantage and potential threats to equity in open science. Um, so we scoped the literature on the evidence and discourse on that, uh, synthesizing results from almost 270 studies. And we indeed found many diverse threats um, to an equitable implementation of open science. The first one is related to the cost of participation that Tony already talked about, that there are um, that you need resources, you need skills, you need infrastructure for at least some of the open science practices. Then there's the open access business model that involves article processing charges that I'll talk much more in, in just a minute. Um, but there's also a lack of reward structures, that there's not, not that much incentive to actually engage um, in open science practices for researchers. And um, it, just briefly want to dive into that a little because we conducted a specific study here 
looking into review, promotion, and tenure policies. Um, we accepted such policies from uh, 107 institutions across seven countries, um, looking at uh, searching on their sites for these policies um, or, or asking if they were not available for them. To, you know, and then coding 17 criteria, which can be summarized into traditional versus non-traditional criteria. And all of them are listed here. Um, the percentages give how common they were in each country. And they're sorted from top to bottom by how common they were in our sample. So the most common one with, uh, with the gap was service to the profession, followed by patents and review and editorial activities. And if we jump down to the bottom, we immediately see that um, practices such as data sharing or open access publishing are minimally rewarded. Um, in, in these cases, not at all. Um, and this extends to, to other um, aspects like publication quality. There is also uh, differences between the countries, obviously very distinct patterns. And one particularly uh, important one is um, can be found in for the United Kingdom. We have quite high engagement with industry, engagement with the public, engagement with policymakers. So many mentions of these of this dimension of public outreach, which can be related to the research excellence framework where, where language on that is included. We also found um, quite, let's say, strong use still of journal metrics and a general level of quantification, um, let's say, despite the interest of DORA. Um, Still, um, still present here, and the general quantification is also exemplified by by a code uh, by by words that we had from one of the policies from the United States, where it states um, numbers help. So quality is important, but numbers do help, and we find that in especially also in Austria. Now I'd like to dive deeper into um, open access here. Um, because as most of you will be aware, there is a transition in scholarly communication from the more um, traditional, let's say, model where libraries pub um, purchase subscriptions with publishers, and then researchers are able to access that literature if they're affiliated with that institution towards open access. And there are many different pathways towards open access, um, which are currently being explored. And one particularly prominent one involves so-called article processing charges, um, APCs in short. And it's prominent because it's being driven by the major publishers, which try to seek, uh, which seek to transition their uh, business model from things towards including more article processing charges. But there is, and, and obviously the idea of open access as Tony um, already introduced was good in a sense that we want to open up um, research that more people are able to participate. But it seems that there is a new barrier now on the other end of the pipeline. So people are able to read, but not everyone is able anymore to publish in certain journals. Um, and there is quite some evidence on, on that already to which we are adding. So there was a study from Silent Al for the US, where they found that authors from higher ranked institutions publish article, publish more open access that involves these APCs, and they also pay higher APCs. There was another study on the US, which found that um, certain attributes, which are mostly related to being better resourced, um, are also related to publishing open access and having higher open access with APCs and having higher APCs. So main gender, prestigious institutions, having uh, previous research grants, um, federal funding. And there's, there's also a more recent finding on the geographic diversity of authors that among similar subsets of journals, uh, those journals that have an APC, that have open access via an APC, have a lower geographic diversity, which adds to this um, claim that there is really a barrier emerging for who can publish in which types of journals. In our investigation, we looked at the relationship between proxies of institutional resourcing and um, average APCs on a global level. 
we looked into differences between fields and countries. And we also investigated changes over time. To do that, we relied on a sample of 1.5 million journal articles. These journal articles were all from um, journals that are listed in the directory of open access journals, community curated list of um, open access journals. Our time frame was 2009 to 2019, and the first and or the last author had to be affiliated with the university that's listed in the line ranking. So there's a selection going on here, but we needed the line ranking for our proxy um, institutional resources. The main bibliographic data for us was of Malex, which we then complemented with um, data from DOHA, line ranking, and the rest. The main indicator that we used was P top 10% from the line ranking, which is the number of universities' publications that belong to the top 10% most frequently cited compared with other publications in the same year. This is a size dependent indicator. So larger universities will have a larger P top 10%. And in our view that um, represents, we use it as a proxy for the general level of resourcing that an institution has um, under the assumption that better resourcing will um, be seen in better library and library support and potentially um, funds for APCs and so on. If we start looking at um, the data and the relationships, first we observe on a bivariate level um, that there is indeed a relationship between the proxy for institutional resourcing and the average APC of the journals where the researchers from these institutions publish in. It's equally strong for first and last authors. And um, we investigated that um, to some extent, but there were no, no big differences between first and last authors. So we didn't um, look at it in all our analysis. But these uh, factors that we see here might be explained by other things such as um, country effects or field effects. And we will get to that in a minute. Look um, at the development over time. We split the proxy for institutional resourcing into four groups, into four quartiles. And we can see here the purple line on top is the top quartile, so the 25, um, top 25 percent of institutions according to this indicator. And this clearly shows, as the figure before as well, that there is stratification going on the top institutions. Uh, researchers from these publish in journals with higher APCs. The stratification is roughly staying the same. So the distances between the quartiles are um, almost the same over the observed period. Um, maybe there is a slight tendency um, that is decreasing, but it's not very strong. And we can see in particular uh, for the last authors that average APCs are rising here. If we look at country differences, we find quite heterogeneous dynamics. And from this figure, we can roughly split um, the countries along the line of uh, $30,000 GDP per capita. The countries above, the higher, relatively higher income countries, all have a very uniform average um, level of APC, all around $2,000, some slightly below, um, up to 2,200, but there is not much variation. But in the segment of the relatively speaking lower income countries, there is a lot of variation. So for example, we have Brazil and the Latin American countries that have very low averages of APCs. And this is to some extent driven by uh, journals with no APC at all, the called diamond um, of massive journals here um, that are particularly strong in Latin America. But even if we take out these journals, um, Latin American countries are still, are still the lowest average. So there are different, there's a different um, publishing culture, but also publishing infrastructure. Um, in America. We also see China, which has a quite high average. And we interpret that um, under the, the literature that from, from cytometrics that we have in, in general, where China is very similar to other higher income countries, 
um, in terms of output, etc. And there is also um, relatively high average APCs among some countries from Sub-Saharan Africa, which can potentially be explained by very specific funding for um, research in, in medicine in medical, on, on certain conditions such as HIV. Um, and this research then is, often, as I said, funded and funds then come with uh, policies to that along with it. To further disentangle the potential effects that we see and in control for regions and country, we created a multi-level model um, that controls, as I said, for field and country. And it's a hurdle model because we model um, two processes at the same time. First, this process, whether a journal has an APC or not, and what the researchers published there. Um, and if it has an APC, how high the APC is. And um, so this is modeled somewhat um, internally in the machine separately, but then our analysis is on the joint level. Here we see um, the results on disciplines. Um, and it can be interpreted um, such as that if we change the resources, the resource proxy by 1%, what kind of change in percentage would we expect from the APC? So overall, we find small to moderate effects in a sense that higher um, levels of resourcing are associated with higher APCs. They're strongest in the social sciences. So on top here, we have political science and sociology, for example. But there is um, very interesting things going on. So for example, in environmental science, uh, researchers from better resourced institutions publish a lot more in journals that have an APC than those that don't have an APC. In mathematics and physics, it's the opposite. In these disciplines, researchers from better resourced institutions publish more in journals that have no APC, and therefore the, the joint effect is negative, at least a, a central point of the measurement, is negative in these disciplines. So there is um, heterogeneous dynamics going on here. If we look at countries, um, the figure is to some extent a mirror of the uh, previous figure on countries that we had, in that uh, countries with a higher, relatively higher GDP per capita have a low effect of institutional resourcing on APCs. Um, and we interpret that as a threshold effect, that if um, a country is at a specific um, level of affluence, of wealth, then their institutions will likely, almost all of them will be able to support APCs and therefore the ranking within the country, the differences in institutional resourcing within the country are not that meaningful because there's a generally high level of funding. But in other countries that have generally lower level of, of research funding, um, in these countries, the differences between the institutions um, seem to make a much stronger difference in terms of the average that, that we find. To summarize, we find stratification in a sense and in line with the literature that researchers from better resourced institutions publish more um, of Lexis that involves APCs and they also pay higher APCs. And this is apparently creating a new barrier for who can publish fair in the kinds of journals. And this has very important implications. So if we take societies and communities that are already less embedded in global science, their voices are further marginalized because they um, lack the resources to publish in the more prestigious uh, journals. And this is a crucial issue because we have many global issues such as the climate crisis that arguably need global perspectives so that we are able to tackle them successfully. And op the open access business model that has APCs is, is, seems to preclude um, these voices from being heard in the more central journals. The uh, findings that we have here also could um, amplify existing inequities. There is some debate, but let's assume that there is a citation advantage to publishing of Maxis. If that's the case, then obviously um, those that are able now, because of the resources, have then 
further advantages um, down the line. And although in our analysis of uh, promotion review and tenure policies, we didn't find that currently there are incentives and reward structures for promotion of nexus, we might assume that this will change in the near future. And this means that those that are unable today to participate um, in a wider open access uh, publishing that's also often in more prestigious journals, uh, then these will have disadvantages in the future. There are a couple of factors that could contribute to the courses that we find. So there is a potential effect of institutional resources on research quality. If we assume that a better resource institution will lead to better research, then this could influence um, our, uh, our findings because there is also a modern correlation between the perceived uh, quality of the journal and the APCs that they have. So this could partly explain um, what we see here. There's also an association between institutional resources and grant funding, because uh, grant funding often has uh, policies to publish open access and better resource institutions might have more of the grant funding. There are also agreements between publishers and universities, and these are maybe more common in higher in income countries, transformative agreements, those are to a large extent focused on hybrid publishing, um, but also to some extent involve uh, gold open access publishing, which waivers and discounts. And there is um, different kinds of evidence on them, but they certainly also play a role in the um, implementation of open access does not uh, exacerbate existing inequalities. The first step, I would argue, is to gather some evidence, and that's what we've done in, in Merit. We've um, gathered a lot of, um, done a lot of research, which is available as deliverables and making its way slowly into publications. As the results that I have presented just now, they will hopefully be um, shortly available as a preprint. And also into also a policy making and the role that open science might be there. And all of that led into a set of 30 recommendations that we have um, created together with um, our stakeholders. And I want to quickly um, show you how that works and I will showcase some of the key recommendations. Our goal was to come up with uh, recommendations that are valid and relevant for the key stakeholder groups, funders, institutions, and researchers. So we gathered a very diverse set of experts um, and engaged in a very iterative process. We started out with our research um, and the initial draft recommendations that we had for that, and then went through multiple rounds of feedback via our online service and via workshops. And to really um, narrow down and, and get the recommendations right. They are available as a briefing under the links here, and they were created primarily by and with European actors in mind, but with an awareness of and an appreciation for the global inequities that exist within the research community. The recommendations target the research ecosystem as a whole. And there are recommendations for everyone. There are highly actionable ones that can be implemented right now. In coming up with the recommendations, we um, selected four focus areas from our research. The first being resource intensity of open research that Tony already discussed. Um, the second one being article processing charges, um, which I elaborated on in detail. We also looked at societal inclusion in research and policy making, how to ensure that um, societal actors are properly included in these processes, and also devised recommendations on a reform of reward and recognition practices. The recommendations on open access publishing that we created are here, and they center around um, 
the call for alternative publishing models that are more inclusive, um, it includes consortial funding models such as Diamond Open Access. To make this happen, to make this possible, we also need sustainable, shared, and open source publishing infrastructures because these will drive down the cost of publishing and enable such alternative publishing models. But as I said, there is also very actionable options that we have. So as institutions and researchers, we should ensure that the accepted version or a later one of our peer-reviewed works is always deposited in an open repository, so it's available to everyone. With that, I say thanks, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. <laughs>